Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the final um, lecture of the Keel Physics Centre programme for 2020 2021. Um, I recognise a lot of the names in the attendees list, so thank you, everybody, uh, particularly those that have gone uh, and got the full collection of six talks this year. Thank you for joining us. For those that haven't joined us before, just a few uh, reminders or instructions to the house rules. Um, I'm Scott. Um, I am the, uh, the lead for the Keel Physics uh, Centre here. Um, this evening we're going to have a lovely talk based on lead called fast reactors. Um, we will have a short five minute interlude halfway through. Uh, for those of you that have uh, eagle eyed, you'll notice we are joined this evening by Stephen, Stephen Bostock, who's our British Sign Language interpreter. That five minute talk helps Stephen, but it also gives you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might like to pose to Rosella towards the end of this evening's talk. The talk itself will last around an hour, um, so we'll finish the talk at eight. We'll then follow that up with as many questions as we can fit in in around 15 or 20 minutes thereafter. Um, towards the end of the talk, I will post in the chat box um, a sign up link to our mailing list, because of course this is the last talk in our series. Uh, that way, if you sign up, you'll know exactly uh, what talks we will begin to present at the start of the next academic year. Um, also in the chat box, uh, if you would like to um, suggest any topics you would like to hear in the next programme, um, I would love to hear them. That will help us select the best speakers for our audience. OK, then. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to this evening's uh, speaker. Uh, her name is Rosella Bonetti. Um, Rosella is from um, Ansaldo Energia. Uh, and she's going to be giving us a talk on lead called fast reactors. So over to you, Rosella. Hi, thank you, Scott, and um, good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you to the organizers for having me here uh, to represent uh, Ansaldo, Ansaldo Nuclear. My name is Rossella Bonetti, and uh, I am uh, working for Ansaldo Nuclear from one year as a stress analyst engineer. And my topic this evening is um, the, a new technology in the nuclear sector that is the lead cooled fast reactor, that is a generation four system. And in particular, I'm speaking about Alfred, that is the Ansaldo lead cooled fast reactor project. Before to go into the into the details of the topic, I want just to introduce Ansaldo and what we are doing in Ansaldo. Ansaldo is born in Italy and Ansaldo Nucleare in Italy together with Ansaldo Nuclear in the UK are operating under the same name as Ansaldo Nuclear and we are offering different services in the nuclear sector Going, go, going from design, engineering, but also we are uh, covering uh, testing, uh, site installation, uh, and also bespoke uh, service. And we are operating in uh, three nuclear uh, business lines that are uh, nuclear new build, plant operation assistance, and uh, decommissioning and waste management. Ansaldo Nuclear, uh, more in general, is a part of Ansaldo Energia Group. Ansaldo Energia has uh, his uh, headquarters in the north of Italy, but uh, as you can see from the map, uh, Ansaldo has um, companies and uh, joint venture and office uh, in different parts uh, of the world, uh, mainly apart from uh, UK and Italy, in Switzerland, China, Russia, Netherlands, Abu Dhabi and uh, America as well. Uh, and apart from nuclear, Ansaldo Energia works in the energy sector, so for the construction and the engineering of a power plant. And also Ansaldo is a leader and it's very famous for steam and gas turbine design, engineering and production. For, uh, for this, uh, the last uh, in, the, in the gas turbine sector, the last entry in the Ansaldo portfolio is the GT36 and we are very proud of this achievement because this gas turbine has been designed to answer to different customer needs 
And uh, this turbine is not only very powerful, uh, the turbine can power over uh, 250,000 uh, households, uh, but uh, is also sustainable uh, because it helps uh, in the reduction of emission uh, as a carbon emission uh, and a nitrogen emission. Uh, and, um, and so I just want to, to, tell, to tell all the audience, uh, if you are interested in what we are doing, uh, please get in contact with me. You can find me on LinkedIn and also you can uh, follow on LinkedIn Ansaldo and Ansaldo Energy and Ansaldo Nuclear. Now, going uh, in, uh, into the topic of this evening, uh, this is uh, the content that I'm going to show, starting from the main drivers that are driving uh, this uh, nuclear transition the importance of the Generation 4 International Forum to identify a suitable system for the Generation 4, what is the lead-cooled fast reactor, the principles at the basis of this technology, a recap on the meaning of fast reaction, the advantages of this technology. I'm going to speak better about Ansaldo program, Alfred, the challenges associated with Alfred and in more in general to the LFR technology. And um, finally, a little bit about Alfred operational approach, that is a stage approach. And finally, I'm going to give some conclusion. So first of all, we have to recognize that our society and our economics are changing. The world population is expanding from um, the current 6 billion people. We are expecting to grow until uh, up to 10 billion people by 2050. And as a consequence, this will generate a growth of energy demand. It is estimated an increase of 38% in the energy demand by 2050. And also we have the obligation to fight the carbon, the, to fight the climate change by reducing our emission, mainly carbon nitrogen emission, in order to keep the temperature, the global rise of temperature below two degrees Celsius by 2050. But also we have to recognize that in our current nuclear system, there are limitations. Today, the nuclear power is more or less 60% of the world electricity, but uh, the current reactors that are thermal type reactors just use about 0.6% of the natural uranium available. There is the problem of spent fuel and waste management and the efficiency in the electricity production is quite low, is about 33%. And also in the current nuclear fleet, there are challenges. The current power plant are facing aging and retirement with approximately 38% of today capacity that is going to retire by 2040. And also the project that we are running now in Western country, most of the time are running over budget and behind the schedule. The Generation 4 fast reactors, and in particular the lead-cooled fast reactor, can offer improvement to address this uh, issue. Here I want to show you a projection of uh, the future nuclear electrical capacity. This was a study that was conducted by the International Atomic uh, energy agency and it took in consideration two possible future scenario a low case scenario and a high case scenario in the high case scenario the nuclear capacity is steadily increasing from today until to reach the maximum in 2050 where the nuclear capacity will be around 700 gigawatt electric. There, so there will be an increase of about 80% from today capacity. Contrary, in the low case scenario, 
in the future years, there will be a decrease in the nuclear generating capacity until 2040, but then the nuclear capacity will rebound until 2050. And so in both cases, also in the, in the low case scenario, the share of the nuclear capacity in the world total electrical capacity will increase 3% in the low case and uh, around 5% in the high case scenario. And so um, in the future, the nuclear, nuclear energy is, need, is needed and uh, the Generation of Fora International Forum uh, that was established in 2000 has recognized the importance of nuclear energy in the future. Today, the Generation 4 International Forum has 14 members that have designed a roadmap for the future, for the future of the nuclear. The main countries are listed below. Uh, we can recognize the, particip the participation of Europe, in Europe mainly UK and France, but also big countries like China, America, Russia. And so this is a very important topic. The Generation 4 International Forum agreed on the importance of nuclear energy to meet the future energy need and to transition to a cleaner energy system. And the International Forum has identified four target areas in order to advance the nuclear in the next fourth generation. So uh, just uh, the nuclear system that answer to these four uh, target area can be said to be inside uh, the generation four category. These four target area are sustainability. This means that the new nuclear system must be able to minimize nuclear waste and have an effective fuel utilization. New system must be safe and reliable. So they must have a very low likelihood and degree of reactor core damage, must be competitive under an economic point of view, and so the cost associated with this technology must be comparable at, or advantageous compared to, to other energy systems. And the other important target is a proliferation resistance and a physical protection. The new system must be an attractive for theft. Below is a figure showing a timeline where uh, we started with nuclear and where uh, we are going, where we are directed. So we can see that uh, from the first um, prototype, now we are entering uh, in the phase of Generation 4, where Generation 4 has a revolutionary design compared to Generation 3 as a light water reactor and Generation 3 Plus. The International Forum has recognized six nuclear systems that answer these four target areas and that can be deployable after 2030. These systems are the gas cooled fast reactor, the lead cooled fast reactor, the molten salt reactor, the sodium cooled fast reactor, the supercritical water cooled reactor, and the very high temperature reactor. Ansaldo is investing in the lead cooled fast reactor. On the right is the timeline of the different system. And um, each system has three phases. There is a viability phase, a performance and a demonstration phase. The viability phase is the phase when the basic concepts are tested under a relevant condition and the potential technical showstoppers are identified and resolved. Then there is the performance phase, that is the phase when engineering processes are tested, the material capability are also verified. The demonstration phase is the phase when the tail design is completed, and licensing construction can start 
with the aim of bringing the technology to a commercial deployment stage. We can see for the LFARA data we are entering now in the last stage, the demonstration stage. Now going more in details in the lead cooled fast reactor technology, first of all the starting principle how the system works. The, the coolant that is the primary fluid is molten lead, is not water as in a traditional as in a traditional nuclear plant. The water is the secondary fluid. The system works at high temperature and low pressure. The pressure vessel is working at almost atmospheric pressure. It's a fast reactor. This means that uh, works uh, differently than a thermal reactor. The fast reactor is based on fast neutrons that have a high kinetic energy associated. And these fast neutrons allow the fission of uranium U238, that is the most abundant uranium in the, in the Earth. And because it's a fast reactor, the system doesn't need the moderator. Here I want to show you some the dimension of the system compared to a person. So the system, the reactor is tall around 10 meter. And inside the pressure vessel, there is the circulation of the liquid lead. And here on the top, there are heat exchanger where the heat from the lead is given to the water in the power conversion unit and then here, here there is the power conversion unit. Here just a quick recap to explain a little bit better the difference between a fast reaction that happens inside a fast reactor and a thermal reaction that happens in a, a traditional reactor. The red line is representing the thermal, is representing the thermal spectrum of a traditional reactor as a light water reactor, and the green line is representing a fast, fast reaction neutrons. In this case, this figure is for a sodium fast reactor, but the same principle applies for the lead cooled fast reactor. So in, uh, in the thermal reactor, the energy of the neutrons are uh, the energy of the neutrons is reduced, so the, so the neutrons are moderated, are slowed down to very low thermal energy where the fission takes place. So the original energy of uh, the neutron is decreased until to arrive at this peak. And it is uh, in this peak that the thermal fission takes place. It is about uh, 0.1 electron volt. Contrary, in the fast reactor, the neutron energy moderation is avoided. So the neutrons keep their energy and the fission occurs in the fast energy range. And this fast energy range is for kinetic energy higher than 10 kilo electron volt, so starting from this point. In this new technology, in the lead cooled fast reactor, there are different advantages that are important and at the basis why Ansaldo is, is, is choosing this technology for the future. First of all, there are advantages in terms of sustainability. Lead is abundant in nature and has a low cost. Lead gives a better efficiency in fuel utilization, so there is a better use of natural resources, but also a better waste management because this system allows a close fuel cycle with the possibility to burn actinides, so reducing the radiotoxicity of the spent fuel. 
and the lead has a low tendency to absorb the neutrons or to slow them down. And so lead is, um, is able to sustain high neutron energy that is needed in fast reactors. Also, there are advantages in terms of safety. And so lead is inert with water, air, and fuel. This means that lead doesn't support rapid chemical reaction that can cause an energy release to the environment. Also, lead has a high boiling point, higher than 1700 degrees Celsius. This allows to have a safe operation at low pressure, avoiding the problem of gas production and reducing the risk of core accident. Lead has also a high thermal capacity, and this is important to mitigate the thermal transient. Lead is a material at high density, and this is good for, uh, for, uh, to, allow, to allow the cooling and to absorb the, the decay heat. Also, the lead has the tendency to retain volatile fission product that otherwise can be released into the environment from the fuel in case of accident. Lead is also, lead also have natural circulation capabilities, allowing to have a high degree of passive safety with the absorption of decay heat in case of accident. The advantages are also under an economic point of view. So this technology allows cost reduction because the technology allows design simplification and greater design flexibility. So for example, in the LFR technology, there is no need for a traditional high pressure resistant containment that is the dome in the, tradi in the traditional reactor. And this is thanks to the lead that is inert. This is very important because normally the dome tends to drive the schedule for the construction. Apart from this, there is the elimination of the need to have an intermediate coolant system to isolate the primary coolant system from the energy conversion unit. And this is because the system is working at low pressure. And also, this technology, with this technology, it's possible to have a modular construction that is suitable for a multi-unit site. Uh, so here, Scott, I want to stop my presentation for uh, five minutes. We are half of the, we are halfway through the presentation. Thank you, Rosella. Yes. So to everybody that normally joins us, uh, this is our five minute interlude. Um, so please go and refill your glasses or your mugs. For those that are already sufficiently topped up, as I am, if you've got any questions you would like to ask Rosella, please pop them into the question box. They will come directly through to myself and I can then pose them to Rosella at the end. So the time is now 7.24. We will resume again at 7.29. We'll see you again shortly.
So Scotha. Yes, Rosella. Is going well or is too fast that you think? No, no, spot on, keep going. Yes, we are about <laughs> to restart. So, no, it's fantastic. We've already had uh, six questions in. So that tells oh me God. that, um, yes, you, um, it tells me that um, it's going down very well. So keep it up, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, we are about to restart. So welcome back, everybody. I hope your glasses are refilled. I've already had six or seven questions. So it's obviously generating a lot of discussion, which is fantastic. Um, to those I haven't responded to yet, um, I will pose all the questions to Rosella, or as many as I can to Rosella at the end of the talk. Um, so stay tuned. So the next half an hour, Rosella, back to you. Okay, thank you, Scott. Huh? And uh, so now I'm going to speak more about the Alfred itself. Alfred stands for Advanced Lead Cooled Fast Reactor European Demonstrator. So Alfred is an European project and will serve as a demonstrator for the Lead Cooled Fast Reactor technology. Alfred is supported by an international consortium that is Falcon, that means Falcon Alfred Construction. And the main partners of this consor consortium are Ansaldo Nucleare, Enea. Enea is the Italian national agency for new technologies and energy development, and Raten ICN, that is the uh, Nuclear Institute in Romania because the research development and infrastructure are, play, are, are planned in Romania. The Alfred concept, conceptual design was frozen in 2013 and the realization of Alfred demonstrator will be around 2025. So this is how the reactor coolant system of Alfred is, uh, is, um, is, um, is the main structure of the reactor coolant system. And um, first things we have to say that uh, the reactor coolant system, as you can see, is divided in uh, two main regions. There is a hot pool region and a cold pool region. And uh, here, uh, all the main component uh, are shown as well. In the hot pool, the lead is circulating at high temperature, um, up to 520 degrees Celsius. In the cold pool, the lead is circulating at low temperature, maximum of 400 degrees Celsius. Inside the system, there is the, the core with the full assemblies, and uh, the core is inside an uh, inner vessel. Uh, the inner vessel has uh, the function to support and restrain the core. Then uh, on the top, uh, there are uh, three reactor coolant pump and also three steam generators. The pumps and the steam generator uh, they are in contact both with the hot condition and, uh, and the cold condition. All the main components are inside the internal structure that is numbered as six. The internal, this internal structure has the function to ensure that the hot and the cold pools are separated. The internal structure ensures the flow circulation. And uh, also, the structure is, um, is important internal structure because it houses the main component. All the structure, the internal structure, is inside the reactor vessel that has an hemispherical shape. It's important to say that all the components are extractable and are separated. This in order to allow uh, maintenance and uh, inspection of the component. 
here is a table summarizing uh, the most important characteristics of the uh, reactor, of the, of the lead cooled fast reactor. The power of the system is a 300 megawatt thermal. The design life is uh, 40 years. The primary system, so the LED system, is working at a temperature up to 520 degrees Celsius and at atmospheric pressure. The reactor is a pool type and compact. The water, so the secondary system, is working at temperature up to 450 degrees Celsius and 18 megapascal. Uh, then the the reactor vessel, the material, is austenitic in stainless steel. As we said, all the components are removable for inspection and maintenance. There are uh, three symmetrical steam generators that are removable, three axial reactor coolant pump that are integrated with the steam generators, and then uh, there is a decay heat removal system. There are two independent and redundant systems. Each system is composed of three independent loops that are passive executed. One system that is the primary decay heat removal system is connected with the steam generators. The other decay heat removal system is an emergency system that is composed of these deep coolers that are other heat exchanger. Um, here I just want to explain better the circulation of the lead inside the internal structure. And uh, this uh, figure is showing one third of the cross section of the reactor coolant system, with uh, also the main, uh, the main place of different components. So, in the, as you can see here in the inner vessel, there is uh, the pump channel that is connected with this part on the top on the hot pool. Then uh, there is uh, the channel for the emergency the key heat removal system, the channel for the steam generator, then there is a, the separator between the hot pool and the cold pool, the general internal structure and the reactor vessel. So basically the lead is extracted from the inner vessel using the three uh, coolant pumps and enter inside the upper region, that is the hot pool. From here, the lead passes in, in the three steam generators, where the heat is transferred to the power conversion unit, or in case of accident, to the decay heat removal passive safety system. At the outlet of the steam generator, the lead, goes down into the bottom region, that is the cold pool. And from here, the lead, from here, the lead from a gap in the internal structure re-enters inside the inner vessel. As we said before, in parallel with the steam generator, there are three deep coolers that are emergency heat exchanger that are connected to a redundant and diverse decay heat removal system that is always a passive safety system and is the emergency decay heat removal. And um, this is the basis of how the lead is circulating inside. Um, there are other details, but I don't want to enter too much into these uh, details. Um, associated with the project of Alfred and in general to the lead cooled fast reactor, there are also some challenges. The most important challenges of this system is the corrosion that is due to the lead contact. 
Uh, so basically, the liquid lead causes the corrosion of steels because it dissolves the alloy element of the stainless steel as iron, chromium, nickel, and the corrosion is accelerated at a higher temperature. This also causes the problem of uh, the formation of um, coolant oxide, lead oxide, that causes the plugging of the structure. In the figure here, is it, uh, it is shown uh, an austenitic stainless steel that is stabilized with titanium. And uh, the substrate is austenitic stainless steel, but the outer layer of the steel is corroded. You can see the layer of corrosion, and this is due to the lead penetration. In order to, um, to limit this corrosion, there are strategies in place. The corrosion is a function of the oxygen inside the lead, so it's important to control the oxygen concentration in lead. In order, to in order to have the oxygen inside the proper range, to avoid uh, as much as possible the formation of uh, lead oxide and minimize steel corrosion. So the strategy for Alfred is uh, to work with an oxygen concentration in the, in the lead in a precise range between 10 to the power of minus 6 and 10 to the minus and 10 to the power of minus 8% to reduce the risk of lead oxide formation. And also, the other strategy is steel passivation, but the steel passivation is stable below 450, 480 degrees Celsius on austenitic stainless steel. So at temperature above 480 degrees Celsius, passivation is not effective. There is the loss of the protective oxide scale, and so it's important to, adapt, to have uh, other protection strategies. These other protection strategies are uh, still under investigation, but there are two main strategies. One is the development of a protective coating, um, mainly alumina layers deposited on uh, austenitic and ferritic steels. But also, there is the investigation of the for the development of a new material, mainly alumina forming austenitic steel and oxide dispersion strengthened alloys. There are also other challenges, but these are minor challenges that can be addressed with a proper um, engineering with a proper design because there are technical challenges. These other minor challenges are forced related with the high melting point of the lead that is 327 degrees Celsius. So a proper engineering is required to avoid the lead freezing. The lead, as we said, is heavy, is an, uh, has a an high density. Uh, so, um, structural seismic consideration uh, must be performed uh, with a compact reactor size and a seismic isolation. The coolant uh, is uh, opaque, so this means that it's uh, difficult to see the component inside. For this, the component instrumentation must be replaceable uh, and accessible. And uh, there is also the problem, uh, there can be the problem of a flow blockage, but this is addressed with a, prop, with a, a proper design in the fuel assembly and also with a multiple fuel assembly flow inlet. Finally, I'm going to speak about this stage approach for Alfred. So um, the lead cooled fast reactor is a new nuclear technology and as every new nuclear technology, it suffers from different challenges as a design challenging, but also safety licensing, operational and financial challenges. So it's important to gain, to have a progressive gain of operational experience in order to reduce the, the risk associated. As we said, the, the, the biggest challenge for this technology is a technological challenge and is related to the material operating at a high temperature and under irradiation condition. 
and uh, Alfred uh, itself, uh, itself uh, will be used as a qualification facility. And in order to do this, uh, a doc approach is developed, that is the stage approach. This means that the operation of the reactor are divided in phases where the core power and the associated temperature are increased step by step from a first stage to a final stage. And mainly, we, um, there are three stages apart from commissioning. You can see here from the first stage to the final stage, there is a difference in the power, in the temperature, in the control of the coolant chemistry, in the material. In the first stage, the power is kept to 100 megawatt thermal, with a maximum temperature reaching 430 degrees Celsius. In this condition, the oxygen control is enough for the control of corrosion. And the material, uh, normal material that are normally used, can be used also here as uh, the austenitic stainless steel 360L. But in the final stage, uh, when, the, when the core is reaching the maximum power of 300 megawatt thermal, the temperature is also the maximum, 520 degrees Celsius. So the same uh, oxygen control system will be in place, uh, but this will be not effective in stopping the corrosion. No? And so this stage will rely, will rely on the coating and innovative materials. Here we can see the stage two, that is a medium temperature, uh, where uh, the core outlet temperature is 480, and is the temperature for which passivation is no more effective to protect the steel. Finally, to give you some uh, conclusion, for sure the interest in the lead cooled fast reactor technology is increasing around the world. And um, this is for what we have said before. So uh, this technology has an excellent uh, sustainability from the point of view of fuel utilization for the uranium that can be used. The nuclear waste uh, concern are reduced due to the ability also to consume a minor actinide. The safety is improved. The economics also is good. It's cost effective. And um, some, there are already initiatives around the world as the Brest project that is under construction and is a project in Russia, but also you, in uh, UK is uh, an active uh, market uh, because uh, in uh, UK the project of Westinghouse, uh, that is the advanced modular reactor project, uh, has been funded with uh, 10 million pounds. And um, the, uh, the phase two of this project has been funded. And uh, this is an important achievement also for Ansaldo. Ansaldo is uh, one of the main partners of uh, Westinghouse uh, in this project. And uh, so to conclude, uh, the uh, Alfred project is, very, is a very important achievement in uh, all the Europe. We can say that Alfred is the milestone in the European lead cooled fast reactor roadmap. And uh, here are some um, references. Uh, for the people that want to go more in details inside this topic. And uh, I thank you for your uh, patience for listening. Thank you, Rosella. As I say to all our speakers, if you were at Kiel now, you would be hearing a rapturous round of applause, unfortunately, <laughs> because every uh, every member of the audience has their speaker uh, on mute. You won't hear that, but I'm sure they're clapping away at home. Now, we do have a few minutes um, and I do have quite a few questions. I, I can't promise we'll get through all of them, ladies and gents, but I will try and ask Rosella as many as I can. Um, if, as long as you're happy, of course, Rosella, but we've got about eight questions, so we, we might just about have enough time for that. So, um, I'm gonna start with a question that's been sent in by Douglas. So thank you, Douglas. Um, he's, his question is, if there is no moderator in an LFR, 
and I didn't see any control rods, how is the reactor controlled? Yeah, uh, I didn't show the control rod, but in reality there are a control rod. I didn't, I didn't enter in the details of the fuel assembly, uh, but there are some paper addressing this topic. So uh, this is just the general assembly, assembly. This is the fuel assembly, but inside this assembly there are a control rod that are used to control the power of the reactor. And so, I... yeah, it's not visible here, but uh, yeah, in the reference, uh, going back uh, here, uh, there, is, uh, there is this paper uh, where you can find more information. But yeah, there are 12, uh, there are 12 control rod. Superb, thank you. I thought that would be the case. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, um, Raphael sent in a, 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 a second question, which is, obviously, you've covered a lot of the positive and the advantages of lead cooled fast reactor Rosella. Um, but Raphael asks, are there any negative aspects and any risks associated with the lead? Um, yeah, the biggest challenge that uh, there is in this technology, as I said, is related to new materials because um, in the hot pool uh, there is this temperature around 520 degrees, but uh, there is also a hot spot uh, in the hotspot uh, is localized uh, in uh, the core assembly. This hotspot, uh, there is um, the temp maximum temperature for this hotspot is uh, 600 degrees Celsius. And uh, in that case, uh, the, the materials uh, will be a challenge. But as I said, in terms of uh, safety, we are working uh, at um, low pressure. And so this is an advantage. And also, as I said, the lead, um, the lead has a high melting has a has a high melting point, 327. But even if there will be a case of lead freezing, these will will not necessarily lead to an accident scenario. Brilliant, thank you. In fact, that brings me on nicely to a question that Colin sent in. Um, you just mentioned the high the high melting point of of lead. Colin asks, how do you start the system up when the lead is still solid? Does it have to be preheated to the melting point first? Yes, the is a preheated. Um, so basically, is a with with a heating system uh, that are connected to the outside. Uh, the is is kept uh, in in the liquid phase. Superb. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Uh, so that brings us on to, uh, I guess, a, a, a nice question from Andy. Andy asks, is electricity generated using traditional concepts of boiling water to make steam drive a turbine? And does the molten lead boil this water? Yes, exactly. The, um, the conversion unit works in the same way. So with water uh, transformed uh, in a uh, steamer, by the, the heat of the lead. And so the, the water pass inside the tubes of the heat exchanger, the, the lead from the shell side, and the steams run a, a turbine. Uh, there are also other projects, uh, is that the Westinghouse project. The Westinghouse project is a little bit different. In this case, the secondary fluid is not water but is a super critical CO2. So I want to be, I want just to say to the audience that there are also other systems as a Westinghouse, the super critical CO2, but in this case, yes, is a normal water transformed to steam. Superb. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a, a step back in time, and I hope you don't mind me saying that, Liz, but uh, Liz has sent a question in that says, in the late 1960s, when I was at school, I went to a lecture by Jacob Bronowski, where he predicted that by the year 2000, every town would have its own small nuclear reactor. She said, but obviously that did not happen, but do these lead-cooled systems make this idea more of a possibility? Yes, yes, because the technology now is more advanced than before. And as I said, the lead is abundant. Um, and uh, is, is at low cost, so more affordable for everyone. 
The other advantage is that uh, is a burning uranium-238 that is also available, more available than uranium-235. And uh, yes, uh, I mean, also, yeah, it can be used from different town cities, just uh, not to have a big power plant, uh, but just have some unit of this uh, reactor to power a city. But um, uh, this reactor maybe will not just be used for electricity production, but also for heat generation and hydrogen production. So these are other advantages. Superb, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't considered that. Brilliant. Um, wow, well, the questions are still coming in. Those that are sending them in, I will try my best to answer them, but um, we don't want to bombard Rosella. So let me just go through a few more. Um, Judy has asked, Rosella, um, are the fast reactors, are, are these fast reactors you were talking about fast breeder reactors? Because she remembers these being a very exciting concept a few years ago. Yeah, this type, uh, Alfred, is not a fast uh, breeder, but uh, um, it can be transformed eventually to be a fast breeder. It's not working with a close of well cycle, uh, but it can be, can be eventually be transformed. As I said during the presentation, uh, there are a project in the lead called the fast reactor that consider a close fuel cycle, so to use the spent fuel and to extract from the, from the spent fuel uh, radioactive element to be used in the second cycle. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, we've, then, we've then got two short questions from Benny and he apologises if he's missed this but the first question is um, what level of enrichment um, does the fuel require and secondly you mentioned obviously that this is a European project. He's asked does that tie into the European Union and will UK nationals be able to be employed on this project? Uh, so the first question is uh, that in the, um, the fuel is a mix oxide fuel using plutonium, using a different concentration of plutonium in the fuel assembly, and uh, this uh, will, uh, will allow the reaction to start, uh, but I'm not sure about uh, the level of enrichment. And uh, yeah, it's an European project. I'm not sure also about the involvement of UK because, as I said, it's mainly done in Romania. But in UK, there is this important project of Westinghouse that is now leading the, this field of lead cooled fast reactor. And Westinghouse is investing in UK. And anyway, there are different partners also for the Westinghouse project. Superb. Right. I'm going to limit it to just five more questions, Rosella. I, you're doing a fantastic job of art. I think it just shows how interested everybody is that they keep thinking. If I don't get to your questions, ladies and gentlemen, I do apologise. But for Stephen and Rosella's sake, we will limit it. So um, Nicholas is asked. Now, you've partially answered this one, Rosella, but um, I think the second half of the question is important. He says, even though the advantages of these lead cooled fast reactors are very beneficial in terms of easier, cheaper and safer containment and heat exchange. Does the main disadvantage, is the main disadvantage being that lead is cheap and abundant, but lead bismuth is expensive and quite rare? Uh, does that bring a major economic issue in terms of the global expansion of these types of reactor? Yes, so uh, at the beginning this technology was done for lead or a lead bismuth and uh, in one side the lead bismuth can ease some challenge. So for, ex for, ex for example, the lead bismuth uh, decreases the melting point, and so this will be beneficial to avoid the freezing, but on the other side is correct. The, the lead bismuth is more rare in, in nature, and lead is more abundant. And also the, the problem of lead bismuth is the generation of polonium 210 and this um, is a contributed to the decay heat uh, and is not negligible uh, in the lead bismuth. This is also a safety case. Brilliant okay so uh, let's move thank you for that that was really interesting. Um, we've got another question from Andy very quickly he asks uh, the reactor is rated at 300 megawatts thermal. What is the output uh, electrical power? 
Yes, the, the Let's Recovery is a 125 that uh, if you think about a comparison with uh, Hinkley Point C, it's very low, but this, allowed, this uh, technology allows multi-site construction. And uh, anyway, this uh, Alfred is the first of a kind. For example, uh, Westinghouse uh, is a building, uh, the reactor uh, that, is, uh, that has uh, um, a power that is uh, three times higher than this reactor. Brilliant. I'm going to, for the for the benefit of time, we've we've got four, but actually three of these questions I think can, can be condensed. So, Thomas, Nathan, and Douglas, thank you for these. I'm going to try and combine them, um, and it relates really to to the the starting up and cooling down process, Rosella. Um, so, firstly, how often does the lead have to be renewed, um, and how long does it take to cool down to do that? And um, so for the refuel, for the refueling, uh, uh, the fuel cycle uh, is uh, longer than a traditional uh, power plant, uh, so can be done uh, around uh, one time every 20 years. Wow. Yes. So is uh, for this it's uh, quite uh, good, uh, but uh, of course uh, the the plant has a design life of 40 years. So refuel refueling. Uh, is, uh, it's done uh, at least uh, once. And uh, for the um, refueling, uh, there is uh, the, the design of the fuel assembly is done uh, to allow the, an um, easier, uh, let's say, refueling uh, because there is uh, an, extended, uh, an extended stem uh, that goes uh, above the, uh, the level of um, the, the lead. And this is connected with an external system where there is a, a flask, where uh, there is a new fuel that then will, will be changed. But we have also to underline that uh, the uh, system is working at uh, low pressure. So there is uh, no need to have a refueling system that are, for example, uh, air, um, uh, air leak, uh, air tightened to avoid the entrance of air. Brilliant. And I think that's. that's a we're going to ask one more question, Rosella, which I think will round this talk off beautifully. And, th and thank you for the depth of your answers. They've been fantastic. Um, this is a more generic question from Raphael to finish. And I think it will put the whole of this evening's talk into a nice context. Uh, Raphael asks, which other Gen 4 reactor designs are also very promising in your opinion? Yes. Um, so um, from what I know, is um, also because uh, an important company as an important company as a Westinghouse is investing a lot in this technology in the UK and uh, in America as well. Uh, for sure, a lead cooled fast reactor uh, is uh, advantageous. Um, gas uh, gas cooled fast reactor, um, sodium cooled fast reactor, sodium cooled fast reactor as well, uh, but less than a cooled fast reactor. Uh, so I really think that the lead cooled fast reactor uh, in, uh, in is the system, the generation of four, uh, that will be uh, that will have more possibilities. Fantastic. Well, that's all of the questions, Rosella. You've done an incredible job to answer them all in 17 minutes. So um, yeah. thank you very much you. again. I just want uh, to say that uh, again, if everyone is interested in uh, in the nuclear sector. Uh, uh, new engineers, uh, graduate engineers, everyone, uh, please uh, come back uh, to me or through you, Scott, that you have my working email. Fantastic. Thank you, Rosella. Just to let everybody know, and I'm just going to pop it in the chat now, um, if you would like um, to, to, to re-watch this particular uh, presentation this evening, uh, you will be able to do so in a few days' time when we upload this to YouTube. Um, so please, if you're not already uh, on our mailing list, please use the link in the chat box. You can sign up in less than two minutes and you'll get all this information this evening, along with, um, well, being the first, I guess, to hear of our new programme starting uh, in the new academic year. So once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, Rosella, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for this evening's talk. Thank you. I thank you, Scott. Thank also you. pass on my thanks to Stephen, who's done a fantastic mm -hmm. job um, for the whole thank of the programme, Stephen. So thank you very much for that. Have a lovely evening, everybody, and thank we'll be you. in touch again soon with a new programme. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye.